despite all of the challenges that you're going to face. That's really the difference is that mindset. We all have doubt. The people that make the biggest impact are willing to put the doubt aside and actually take action despite the feelings that they have. Welcome to Inspired by Success, the podcast where I deep dive into the mindset of successful entrepreneurs, CEOs, and thought leaders. Get ready to be inspired and gain valuable insights to unlock your true potential. Transform your financial future with this episode sponsored by KE Financial Services. Today, we've got a true game changer in the world of real estate with us. He's a visionary CEO of Norhart, a $200 million construction company. Under his leadership, he's grown from 80 to over 1,000 units, creating $230 million in assets. His name is Mike Kading, and his journey isn't just about building structures. It's about transforming lives and tackling the housing crisis head on. Get ready for a conversation that goes beyond blueprints, filled with resilience, innovation, and a commitment to making a real impact. Mike, well, I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This will be fun. Tell us about your story and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, you know what? At a simple high level, what we're focused on is really driving down the cost of construction because we build and manage these properties. We've been achieving about a 20 to 30% reduction in those costs, and we want to get to a 50% reduction. But imagine what that means. That means someday your rent, your mortgage payment could be half. And that's really our dream is to solve housing affordability. Because for so many people across the world, housing is just too expensive. Mm. You know, my parents started this business. So I grew up with it. I was out there sweeping and, and pounding out nails and helping build walls and all of that. But while we were growing up, we actually lost everything. And at one point, my dad was actually kidnapped in Peru. Crazy side story. Mm. But as we grew up with this business, I got to learn a little bit about how these buildings were made. Went off to college, though, and the one thing that I knew is that I didn't want to join the family business. And the reason this was is I don't want people to think it was given to me. So mm. I had to wrestle a lot with my ego. But what I, what I came to realize is that deep down, I wanted to make some kind of meaningful, positive impact in the world. And I realized I could take this small business and grow it to that kind of scale to have that impact by solving housing affordability. So I jumped in full throttle with my dad. And my dad and I about doubled the size of the company in the first year. Still very small. And then one day, uh, he unexpectedly passed away which I can share that story, but just a crazy story that I lost him. Overnight, I became CEO of this company. In fact, I didn't take the title for five years because I didn't, want, because I didn't feel like I'd earned it yet. Mm. And it, there was so much struggle that came out of that where I just I didn't know what I was doing. I had to prove myself, right? And it was it was a tough journey. But that that is sort of the start of all of it. Wow. You said you lost like you guys lost everything. How did that happen? And how did you guys rebuild when you lost everything? Yeah, it's it's actually tied to that story of my dad getting kidnapped. Oh, jeez. Yeah, when my parents were very philanthropic, they wanted to support mm -hmm. people in the community. And so they were big into uh, the Special Olympics. It's basically the Olympics for people that have special needs. Mm -hmm. And one year, it was here in Minnesota. And the families, they needed support coming to be part of the Special Olympics. They needed a place to stay. So my parents uh, hosted a number of families. And one of those families, the father's name was Pancho. I started building this relationship with Pancho. He actually stayed in contact with my parents for like six months, eight months. And Pancho shared this story of how Peru at the time needed more public transportation. Because there wasn't much in Peru at that time. And my Dad agreed to work with Pancho to actually purchase buses here in the United States and send it down to Peru. And then Pancho would operate those buses and then return some money back to my dad for paying to buy those buses. Well, they started this off. My parents sent the buses down. And it was working great initially until about month three where Pancho stopped sending payments. He was still making money, but he wasn't sending the money back. To my dad. Mm. My dad ended up making regular trips to Peru, and that whole scenario went all the way to the Peruvian Supreme Court, where Pancho actually paid off the Peruvian Supreme Court, and those justices magically disappeared at the end 
for my dad's uh, case in favorable justices for uh, Pancho stepped in and my dad lost the case, lost everything. That's where we lost our money. But during that time, my dad was actually walking along the beach in Peru as he did many times over. And this guy came up to him and said, dude, you're, you're an American. You're from America. Like, tell me everything about what America is like. And then this guy disappeared. And then a few moments later, four uniformed police officers walk up to my dad and they tell him, that guy you were just talking to, well, he's a known drug dealer. Now you need to come to the police station with us. Oh, wow. So they walk my dad to their vehicle, very small vehicle, five seats, two, only two doors, two people in the front, two people in the back. And he was in the back middle. And the moment he got into that car, he realized something far too late. And that's that these were not real police officers. They start heading to the part of town that my dad knew that he should never go. And they start asking him for money and, you know, show me everything you got. And he was showing them, I have no money. And he can offer shoes. I don't have any money in my shoe. I'm putting a shoe back on. But my dad had this look about him. Like, he looked like the guy that you wanted to try to rob. He looked like an American, maybe had some money, who didn't quite know what he was doing. He was the yeah. perfect prime target. <sighs> and he'd actually been robbed once before. And he learned through that experience one important fact. And that is you have about one second before somebody knows what, or realizes what you're doing. So while they're heading to the bad part of town, my dad starts formulating this idea, this plan of how he is going to escape. And he's going to do it when the car reaches about 15 miles an hour. So he's waiting for the next stoplight and the speedometer goes down from 50, down to 40, down to 30, down to 20, down to that magical moment of 15 miles an hour. At this point, his plan springs into action he actually leaps forward past the passenger in the passenger seat, grabs the door handle, opens the door, and the momentum of the slowing car whips that door open and actually pulls them out of the vehicle all in about that magical one second before yeah. they realize what's going on. He runs wow. backwards down traffic to safety and never sees those kidnappers again. Wow, what a miracle that he survived that. Jeez. Yeah, is that crazy? He's got. Uh, he's obviously a risk taker, and uh... <laughs> <laughs> I suppose maybe not intentionally. <laughs> and that's helped him in his entrepreneur journey because you you yeah. do need to be a risk taker to be able to be an entrepreneur, I guess. And tell us from starting all over again, becoming the CEO. How did you manage to scale it to like two hundred million? Where you are now? I'm curious to know because it takes a certain mindset to achieve that level of success because most businesses, a lot of small family businesses don't make it past five years, you know, but you've done this for what, over 19 years, is that right? So yeah. you've, done, you've definitely done something right and the mindset's there. So tell us, I'm curious to know how you got it to this level, like what skills were involved to become this successful? Yeah. One of the amazing things that I get to do is just meet some of the most incredible people in the world. People that are literally making billion dollar kinds of impacts. In fact, I just got off the phone just a, an hour ago with probably, um, she's on the Forbes list of the richest women in the world. And I asked her the same question. I said, in my experience, there's something different about the people that have tremendous success. There's a little bit different of a mindset. Mm -hmm. So I asked her her perspective on it. And she gave me a very similar perspective that I'm about to give you now. I'm going to share it through a story. I'm going to start off with the story of my dad passing. because I think that kind of illuminates this journey. I remember one day coming to the office and we got a phone call from the bank. And the bank said, Mike, these paychecks you have going out to people, well, they're about to bounce. You don't have enough money in your bank account to pay off your employees. You know, we weren't that big, only a few employees at the time. But we had never missed an employee paycheck never in the past and never since never ever right mm. i knew something was wrong so we call up my dad and we realized that he'd actually move money into the ba wrong bank account something was a bit off he came into the office and we sat down to have him write a check from one bank account to the other to make make this all work 
And my dad was unable to write the check. Immediately, I knew something was wrong. I, I filled out the check for him, signed his name. He went back home. We actually, my wife and I went home to my parents' house that night, and he seemed quiet and a bit distant. And unsure of what was going on, my wife and I went home that night, and the next morning, I got a frantic call from my mom saying that something was really wrong with my dad. He wasn't willing to go to the hospital. I dropped everything and immediately raced over to my parents' home, pleaded with my dad, and my dad agreed to go to the hospital. And at that moment, I actually walked into the pantry of my parents' house, and I just started bawling, crying, because I knew that was probably the last moment I would ever see my dad in that way. And he left to go to the hospital, and it turned out he had a brain tumor that caused a stroke. And they did emergency surgery that night. And he actually lived for another six months. But we lost him for all intents and purposes that night because he wasn't the same. He wasn't him anymore. He's just a shell of a person. He was, he was breathing, but his mind wasn't there. Wow. And so literally the next day after that had happened, he was CEO. And at this time, we had a major project moving forward that we were working on. And I was fighting to get through the city council. It was really a big challenge. I, there was lessons I didn't know, like the importance of building relationships in advance. And I had pushed certain things that I shouldn't have that created bad blood with me and the city council. And eventually we got approval, but the city looked at me as some pip squeak kid that I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is I was some pip squeak kid. I didn't know what I was doing. And they had like a laser focus on us. In fact, they shut us down twice. And the second time they shut us down, they pulled me into the city offices. I'll never forget this. Sat me down. And with all their big wig titles, all the big officials within the city, looked at me and said, Mike, we don't believe you can do this. You need to hire someone else who can take over what you're doing. Talk about a blow to your ego. And mm -hmm. I didn't have much of an ego at a time because mm -hmm. I was struggling to get by. Mm -hmm. My dad had just passed. Mm -hmm. And we ended up hiring someone in just a few days which is not a good way to hire someone, but that's what we did. He was sort of a front man to help give us some, some breathing room. Yeah. But I remember a few, about a month or two before we were supposed to open that project, we had a water main test. This is a large pipe buried 15 feet in the ground, more than a thousand feet long. And we failed that test. There was a pinhole water leak somewhere in that water main. Hmm. and I, my excavator didn't want to stay, and I, I pled with him. I stayed out there with him. We were out there for weeks, and I was in my nice clothes, in the mud, shoveling, digging, looking for this tiny little leak that we could not seem to find. Eventually, we found it, and just a few days before we were supposed to open, the city staff came out and said, "There's look, Mike, there's no way you're going to open this building. I have families waiting to move in, and unless I can get approval, they're not going to have a place to live. Mm -hmm. The last day, half a dozen inspectors, half day inspection, they looked at every nook and cranny of that building. At the very end, I'll never forget this. The building official, head building official, pulls me aside in the parking garage. And he says, Mike, I know we were hard on you, but honestly, looking at this now, this is the best building that we've ever opened in this city. Wow. Finally, some relief, right? Like, maybe we can do this. And this is, I think, the important lesson. This is really what I think differentiates those who achieve a billion-dollar level and those who just live average lives. Mm -hmm. And that is the recognition that most people won't believe in you. Most people don't think you have what it takes. And in fact, to some degree, you don't because you need to learn that through the journey. But you have to have tenacious energy and drive to sustain it for, for years, despite all of the challenges that you're going to face. That's really the difference is that mindset. We all have doubt. Mm. The people that make the biggest impact are willing to put the doubt aside and actually take action despite the feelings that they have. Wow. That's, yeah, definitely great words of wisdom. And so you didn't have much experience, right? But what did you use to help level yourself up? Like, you know, did you have mentors? Did you, was it just all a matter of trial and error? Like, or you would have had taken some of the abilities and you, what you've learned from your father as well, but 
still achieved a lot of success to grow it to where it is. So, you know, tell me, take me through those strategies and, and what actually helped make it so successful, whether it was the people that you hired, you know, the processes, the systems. There's definitely a lot to, to getting that level. Yes, there is so much. Um, I'll touch on your first question first, though, and that is how do you learn the skills you need? Because the reality is that we are, are all terrible at when we start. That's okay. That's part of the process. You know, we're born and we can't walk, we can't talk, we can't ride a bike, mm -hmm. and we're okay as a young kid. Like, we understand we're just learning the world, but something happens on us as we get older that we start to feel like we've got to have everything figured out. The reality is we don't. This is a great study where they took two groups of people, and the first group were, were told to make the best clay pot that they could. And the second group was told to make as many clay pots as they could. Well, at the end of the study, they looked at that first group and their first and best clay pot, it was good. It was actually a really good spot. In fact, it was better than the first pots of the second group. But here's the magic. That second group, even though the first clay pots were terrible, the later ones were so much better than that first group. So the first thing in that learning, that growing that you need to do is to learn and grow from others. Don't get me wrong. I, I spend, honestly, I spend about 15 hours a week, every single week, learning as much as I can. That sounds crazy. It sounds impossible. Mm. Not that hard. You put audiobooks in mm. while you're driving to and from work. Mm -hmm. I do a 15 mile run every Sunday. That's a few hours I get to learn, listen to podcasts like your podcast. <laughs> I watch uh, documentaries uh, during dinner time. I, mm. At night, as I'm falling asleep, I watch YouTube videos. Mm. It's shocking how much you can learn on YouTube, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you need to learn and grow as much as you can. Oh, in, in mentors, finding the world's best people and getting them to be mentors and coaches of you, game changing. Because the best people, they they know so much more than the average expert, and there's a whole whole world in making that a reality. But so you need to do that and do that well. So don't get me wrong there. But I would say even more than that, is you just got to get out and try. Mm -hmm. Because you learn so much in this iterative process of try, fail, try, fail, try, fail. And most people are scared to try because they're scared of the failure. But you just have to understand that the failure is just part of that process. The goal is not not to fail. The goal is to fail and fail fast so you can learn and iterate. And that is really the key. What are your biggest failures that have turned around to be massive like success stories and big wins? Oh, so many. <laughs> um, to narrow it down to one, I would say I talked earlier about driving down the cost of construction. Mm -hmm. Well, part of that driving that cost down is in the world of construction, we have all of the different trades, electricians, plumbers, HVAC, engineers, architects, wall panel manufacturing, precast concrete, supply chain, it's all under one roof. That is unheard of in this industry. Well, that was not a pre-planned decision. That actually came out of this iterative failure process. And you know, when we were building uh, some of our earlier buildings, I had a um, plumber come up to me and said, Mike, I know we've been doing the same sort of building each year, year in and year out, but I'm sorry to say for the next building, we are going to have to triple the cost of the plumbing. Triple. And wow. looked at him and was like, I can't pay this. <laughs> Do you think I made out of money? Like, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have the money to pay this. Yeah. And uh, it's like, well, good luck. Find another plumber. So we're looking and all the other plumbers are just as expensive or they're not available. And this sparked an idea I said, well, couldn't we just be plumbers? Can't I just go buy a bunch of plumbing books? I mean, you're just going to <laughs> together. How hard can it be? Water flows downhill, right? But in doing that, it was a failure. We ended up spending just as much money, if not more than we would have if we had hired it. It was a tremendous amount of work. We did plumbing so many, so many wrong in so many different ways. When you could have just done it from the start and paid, oh, but triple the exactly. price. Exactly. But here's the magic. See, we went through that failure process and we learned. And yes, the first time through it, it may be more expensive. Mm. The second time, it wasn't. The third time is even better. And the fourth time, we are now achieving costs that were at or lower 
than what the plumbers had originally been doing. And so see, you kept it up. You kept that uh, look yes. like internally and you didn't outsource. You ended up keeping it within. Exactly. And one of the lessons I learned later in, in our adventures of doing this is that curve is incredibly normal. In fact, we face that every single time we do something new, it becomes so much worse before it gets better. And the later lesson I learned, the failure that I learned, is that you can't stack too many of those on top of each other. Otherwise, you get this giant spike of challenge before you actually see the benefits. So there's a bit of spreading that out. But don't be afraid of something new. Yes, it's going to be bad initially, but it gets better in the long term. Wow. Very inspiring. Now let's talk about like the real estate market and housing affordability, you know, because the economy is not doing so well. Interest rates keep affecting the real estate and the landscape overall in general. So how will you guys contribute to solving that um, issue with the U.S. housing affordability crisis, especially in the long run as well? I know that you said you want to cut costs down, but the impact of the interest rates, how will you go about solving that? Oh. Well, the interest rates is a whole thing in and of itself. I'll talk about reducing costs though first or solving housing affordability. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're driving down those costs, right? We're already achieving about 20 to 30%. The question is, how do we do that? Well, part of it, as I just mentioned, is bringing all the work under one roof. When we mm -hmm. do that, we can then save the subcontractor profit margins, but we can start doing something. Well, let me mention this first. If a construction company were to produce a car, You'd have a different company installing the windshield, a different company installing the door, and a different company installing the wheel. And of course, the wheel company, they would call you up and say, hey, I am so sorry. I got delayed on another project and I can't get out there for two weeks. You'd be totally shut down. Mm. See, the world of manufacturing looks at us and says, dude, you're insane. And we respond with, well, this is the way we've always have done it. See, if you look at other industries like manufacturing, they've improved labor productivity by 760% over the past 60 years, where construction has done nothing. It's been stuck at just 10%. Mm -hmm. So why not learn from the best, like Toyota, for example, which is world-renowned in their improvement in manufacturing processes. We actually just contacted them. And now they're working with us. If we can take those lessons and learnings from them and apply it to our own industry, we can see success. So to give you one tidbit there, we brought all the work into one roof, but then we can start applying crazy, simple techniques like the assembly line. I know, revolutionary. <laughs> but the thing is, how in the world can you take a building and drive it down a line? Well, you can't. Here's the magic. You can take the person and move them through the building. So right now, every five hours, our teams shift by about one unit through the building. So every five hours, we produce a brand new apartment unit. And that one technique might take a building that might take 15 months to do and drive it down to nine. But there are 10,000 little techniques that we do to drive down costs. Now, you also asked about interest rates. Interest rates have risen. <laughs> They're so much higher than they used to be. And this creates a huge problem in the real estate market. In fact, in the United States right now, new apartment buildings being started is down by about 70 to 80%. So there's dip that's happening. Now there's existing products that are being completed. They're still coming on the market. But in the next year or so, we're going to see that dip flow through. And we won't be producing anywhere near the number of apartments that we need to produce. And so housing affordability is about to get worse because of that. And that's because these deals don't actually pencil out anymore. Now, for us, they do pencil. In fact, we were building buildings, you know, again, about 20 to 30% less. And banks would actually fund the vast majority, if not all, of the projects that we were doing, which is unheard of in the market. But now, because those interest rates have risen, bank proceeds and the amount banks will give us has gone down. So this is just in the next new challenge. There's always new challenges, right? This is the next new challenge for us. Mm. Now we're not having to pivot 
and to actually raise capital in ways that we've never had to do before, mm. which has been just fantastic having to learn that new next challenge. And so that that's how it's hit us. And I'll touch on one last thing, which might be going through the minds of the listeners. So Mike talked about lowering costs, talked about this new challenge of interest rates, but that doesn't change my rent, right? Mm. In fact, if I go into your website today, your rents are no less than any other developer out there. What the heck? Well, Elon Musk talks about how it's hard to produce a car, but it is 10 to 100 to 1,000 times harder to build the system that builds that car. So true. So what we're doing is we're taking those profits and we're building it into the system that builds housing. And we're working to scale that up. Our goal is that over the next 10 years, that we're producing about 60,000 units per year, and then we're building out about 192,000 units under management. At that point, we're producing so much housing for the marketplace that we're impacting supply and demand. With an abundance of supply means that prices start coming down naturally. And it's not just for our own residents. It's for everyone within the markets that we're producing those homes. What a purpose. I mean, like you sound like you have a philanthropic side as well to and helping, you know, the community and achieving just affordable housing as well. So that's very inspiring. And, and you talk about the improving of little things and learning. So you've got the growth mindset and you take on challenges as well. Can I ask what books or like what mentors or books have changed, like helped you develop who you are today? Because I'm very interested in just the way that you think and the way that you handle challenges. Some people, there's fixed mindset and there's growth mindset. And obviously you've got the growth mindset, but are there any books that have helped you with your thinking and the way you, the, the man that you've become today, basically? Yeah. There's so many. It's I probably read close to a book a week. And I look for people that are meaningfully changing the world. Probably my favorite book just recently that came out is uh, Elon Musk and the Walter Ideson uh, biography of, uh, of Elon Musk. Just incredible. There's so much in there. It's, it's not necessarily a here's the five steps to becoming a great leader, but the perspective that Elon has on things is just different mm. and gaining a little bit of that nugget, a little bit of that wisdom and applying it to my own life has been helpful. But I would say if there's one book that really changed my thinking on something that radically transformed our business, it's No Rules Rules by Reed Hastings, who's the founder of Netflix. And the one concept that changed my world is simply to hire the very best. And when I say the very best, I actually mean the best. I truly mean like world-class people. We have people that we will fly in from other states to come work during the week and fly them home on the weekend because of the best in the world of what they do. One of our employees in 2007, Steve Jobs announces the iPhone. Steve Jobs walks off that stage and our employee walks on that same stage following Steve Jobs' presentation. It's that kind of caliber of per people. And here's the crazy thing. The best people, they change things. They make things happen that you didn't know could happen. They unlock doors that were shut forever before. They change the world. Now, what most business leaders stop me and they say, Mike, that sounds expensive. Mm. And it's true. If you look at it on a cost per person basis, it's very expensive because you have to pay them top of market to find that caliber of people. But here's what most people fail to understand. The best people outperform the average by two to five to 10 times as much. And that's for every level of the organization, even if it's down just to a cleaner. We've got painters that are so in love with how they do painting. They do testing of different paint rollers 
different paint types. They create YouTube videos and TikTok videos on the different testing that they've done on the paint. Maybe they can't get to a 10x improvement, but they certainly can get to a 2x to a 3x improvement over the average painter. So if you look at it on a cost per unit produced, the best people outperform the average so much so that it is actually less expensive to hire the best. And so when the business leader tells me that they are afraid that they can't hire, they can't afford to hire the best, mm. my response is, you can't afford not to. Mm. Wow. But uh, you've got, yeah, it sounds like you've got some very high standards there. But in order to keep these people happy, they need a good leader. So tell me what's your leadership style and doing something right to be lasting so long and having these awesome people work for you. What makes a good leader and what can you share your leadership style? So much to that. I think one of the places I would start or that I think a lot about is what is your purpose, mission, your values? And understanding what that is for you and your business, it doesn't come overnight. It doesn't come over a weekend. In fact, you've got to try something and fail with it and then like bump it against a wall and then get feedback on that and then experiment for a while and play around with things for years. It took me years to get to this point. But I think the more subtle thing that's maybe insightful that maybe people don't quite understand is that your people are really, really good at knowing if you are authentic or if you're not quite lined up with what you're saying. And I think what's more important than creating a set of values and a purpose and mission that you think sounds good is actually just creating something that's authentic mm -hmm. to you, right? So if for you, Maybe you don't want to change the world. Maybe you just want to live a comfortable life, but maybe it's a great work-life balance for people. Like, it's okay. Don't talk about changing the world. Talk about living a nine-to-five life. Or maybe for you, it's about uh, making a ton of money. Like, that's typically not a great purpose for people to talk about that. But if that's who you are, and for you, it's all about the dollar, talk about, like, that should be what you talk about. Like, dude, you're going to make million-dollar bonuses here. Now, you're not going to have a family. You're going to work through the night. But the magic in that is being really clear about who you are, lining up your stated purpose and mission in that, is you're going to attract the kind of people that are inspired by that kind of purpose and mission, right? There's nothing worse than telling people you're of one mission, having them get hired on and realizing it's just not a fit, mm. right? So I think that's a key part of all of this. I think another key part for me, I actually do all of our orientations. So every single new employer that we hire, they yeah. sit down with me. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it's a it's a it's a larger event, right? It's not just me one on one, mm. but I do all of those personally. And I think that's important because you need to set that culture, that that pace to begin with. Then we do what's called follow up orientation, where about a month or two later, everyone comes back and we talk again about what is what is it actually like. Because I can project all I want about what I want it to be like, but it's not always exactly that way. And I need that feedback so that I can make changes and adjust based on what people hear. Another key part of it is simply in how who you choose to hire. So we talked about hiring the best, but putting the process in place and making sure you actually get the best. You know, for us in construction, it was incredibly hard to find great people, but it's your people that create that culture. Right, Com People often join a company because of the reputation of the leader or the reputation of the company, but they will leave based upon the interactions that they have with the people around them on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really important to get those people right. Mm -hmm. So you know, initially it was, it was really, really hard and we, we did not know what we were doing. Pretty much if you could breathe, we would hire you because we needed people to do the work. Mm -hmm. This is quite normal in, in construction. Uh, we changed everything. In fact, we ended up laying off the majority of our company and we rebuilt uh, our teams from the ground up. <laughs> we ended up hiring out a whole recruiting team. Uh, in fact, there was about, at this point in our company, we were only about 100 people. We hired on about a dozen recruiters. And then those recruiters spent months trying to build a network and relationships with people in our community that were of that top caliber. We started feeding them into our organization. Then, our, so we have this elaborate uh, hiring process, but even if once you get hired, you're not 
For most positions, you're not actually fully hired yet. We call it a trial period where you have two weeks and you work with your team and your team makes the decision whether or not you are hired. Wow. And how do they make that decision? They make that decision based upon the stated values of the company. And once you have a great team, they don't want to work with anyone less than amazing. And they're great at sniffing out people that mm. are not the kind of caliber of people that they want. And so that becomes uh, an important milestone. And I could go on and on and on about all of this, but I'll give you one last tidbit. And this one we actually stole from Netflix it's called the keeper test. The question we ask as managers is, if this employee were to quit tomorrow, how hard would I fight to change their mind? Or put another way, if your employee were to come to you wanting to be hired tomorrow, would you hire them? And the answer is you wouldn't fight for them or you wouldn't hire them. Why are they here? Right? That's a hard thing to wrestle with, but most managers are stuck in this like lukewarm state where they decide to keep average people around. What we say is average performance gets a generous severance. We'll support people really well on the way out, but unless you're among the very best, then this just isn't the right culture for you. It's not to say you're not great and there's not a great place that you will fit. That's just not, we need people that are going to change this industry. And that's a challenging one because it not only creates an environment that's sometimes a bit scary for people, right? Am I good enough? Mm -hmm. and we have systems and, and ways in place to help people get comfortable if they're in a good spot. But by doing that, being really disciplined with that, the people that you have left are just amazing. And I've seen what amazing teams look like. And it's almost intoxicating because of that collaboration, the connectedness, the working together to solve problems. And that's what you want throughout your whole organization. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, that's a lot of great feedback there. I'm just curious about you as a leader as well. Like what daily rituals do you do to maintain this successful life that you, you're living? You know, one thing I learned early on is the importance of making sure you've got certain habits in place. You know, uh, when I was in college, I would try to push myself to see how I was far as I possibly could go on stuff. And I remember once, so one half of a semester, so just a quarter, I took just a crazy course load. I was at the University of Minnesota. The maximum course load you could take was 16 credits. Oh, sorry, the full course load was 16 credits. The maximum you were allowed to take, no more, was 20. But one of my, uh, just for one quarter, for one quarter, I took 27 credits. And uh, I had special approval for it. It was insane. And I would take the hardest classes I could find. In fact, one of those classes was, uh, was honors abstract algebra. It was a graduate level, honors level math course where, no joke, the people in that class were literal geniuses. I think a number of them have gone on to do just incredible things in the world of mathematics. I was not a math genius. I was like just barely holding on. But I would just do that to see how far I could push myself. And in doing that, I, I learned some important lessons. And, and one is this notion of habits. And so I learned that I always needed to get a full night's rest. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't do that, if I try to cut corners there, then I was much less productive during the rest of the time and I would just fall behind. So I, I always made sure I slept was one thing. Another thing is that I'm always making sure I get an exercise, right? So there are three times a week I do weight training. One day a week I do 15-mile run. Um, it's Maybe I should do more, but at very least I am always doing that set of activity. For me, I'm always home at 6 o'clock to be home with my kids. And there's certain rituals and things that we do together. For example, every Saturday and Sunday morning, my daughters wake me up at just an early hour like five or six o'clock so that we can play Mario together. We play Super Mario Wonder and things. And we've got this YouTube channel we work on, but it's so important that we've got that right. I make sure that I spend time with my wife and kids because if I don't get that relationship right, everything else kind of falls apart. Mm -hmm. and so there's certain core elements that I always make sure to get right. And then 
I still have quite a few hours in my day. I fill in everything else that I need to get done for the rest of my life. And I'm guessing because people get like, you know, there's the common question, how do you balance? And like for an entrepreneur, like the work-life balance, how do you get it right? But I guess by the way I'm hearing it, you've got the great people in place to help you achieve that certain balance. Is that right? That's true. I will say though that it still requires a tremendous amount of hours. And so I think being very purposeful about my wife and my kids and making sure that when I get home, I am I am everything they need me to be. I'm super there, energetic. Even if I had a tough day at work, it doesn't matter. I am there. I'm supporting them. I'm doing what they need uh, from me. But by pouring so much into them when we are together, they allow me the freedom to spend the hours that I need to do in our business. And honestly, like there are times where it is a hundred hour plus kind of environment because it's just sometimes we go into challenges that just require that level of energy. And it's it's tough. It's really hard. The one thing that I probably sacrifice is sort of like self-relaxation, right? Like mm -hmm. kind of just relaxing on my own. But I've learned that if I get some of those core elements right that I don't need that, I can be on at such a high level to produce what I need to produce. Awesome. So like what advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs looking to make a significant impact in the real estate industry or in general? I mean, you've given such amazing advice today and I hope if, if, if everyone enjoyed this, please do us a favor and hit the like and subscribe button because it helps the channel grow and we can bring in amazing guests like Mike. So um, yeah, what, what advice do you have for other entrepreneurs hoping to make a massive impact the way you have? I think the big thing early on is it's, it's mindset. Mm -hmm. I think if you get into it and you think it's just going to magically work out, it won't. And everyone's going to tell you no. Everyone's going to beat you down. I, like I mentioned that um, the lady I was on the phone with earlier today, who's the, one of the wealthiest women in the entire world, she's self-made. And she told me, she said that she was making 300 phone calls a day to get a sale. And she did that for, I think, six or nine months with no sale. Her parents told her what she was doing was crazy. She shouldn't be doing it. Her friends told her don't do what she did. She actually left a job that was making her great money and everyone thought she was nuts. How much do you want to bet that she started to worry herself that she might be nuts, that she may have made a mistake? Absolutely. Mm. One of, we have our own show and uh, uh, one of the guests I had on that show recently, his name was Michael Uslan. He's the originator and the executive producer of Batman. In fact, he just barely eked out some money from investors to buy the movie rights to Batman before you know, people really had an uh, affiliation with it. And he spent 10 years, 10 years fighting day in and day out, people slamming their door in his face, telling him no, telling him it was crazy. He wanted to make a dark and serious Batman movie and everyone told him there was no way, no one would ever watch a dark and serious Batman movie. But he believed in it because he was such a super fan. He's really the biggest comic book fan I'd ever met. And uh, uh, he kept with it. And after 10 years, he finally got approval to do the movie. And the rest is history, right? We've all seen the Batman movies. He's done National Treasure. He did the Lego movies. He was, uh, when I was calling him to get on our show, he was on the set of the Joker movie, right? Like this is where he is at today but it took him 10 years of people telling him no to get there. And so the same for you, if you're just starting out, this is a journey. You're gonna have so many people tell you no, and you need to have the mental fortitude to get through that and to, to learn the lessons, to grow along the way, because you're gonna be terrible at first, that's okay, be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Just have the tenacity to make it through that out the other end so you can see the success that you deserve. Wow, that's incredibly inspiring. Looking ahead, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind for the world? You know, my dad, my dad died at a relatively young age and it really reminded me how short life really is. Mm. We only live about 5,000 weeks here on earth. I actually think about this a lot. And the, it's sad to say we only live that long, but I often ask myself the question, how do I want to spend the minutes I have here on earth? And for everyone, that answer is different. But for me, I want to make some kind of meaningful, positive impact in the world. To quote Steve Jobs, I, I want to make a dent in the universe, or at least I want to die trying. 
And for me, the dent that I think we can have within our lifetime is to solve housing affordability. And that's my dream. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. <laughs> okay. Finally, where can people find you? Because um, you are just so phenomenal, inspiring and yeah, it's just, you've got your own podcast too. So yeah. Tell us where people can find you. Yeah. So uh, the best place is to visit our website. That's norhart.com. N O R H A R T dot com. When you visit that, a couple of interesting things. One is you can click on shows. You can see a couple of different shows we have going on, including our uh, show Zero to Unicorn with some of those billion billionaire guests that I talked about earlier. We really explore the journey of going from that small business to billion dollar scale. Mm. Um, another fun show is one started by my daughters. And that one's actually grown quite a bit. Uh, it's more goofy and fun. You get to see a little bit more of the personal life. But to give you some sense of this, we actually went and filled a dump truck full of candy and then drove around the neighborhood giving it out to the kids. And eventually we gave the majority of it away to those, uh, to food shelves in the neighborhood. Wow. Uh, the other interesting thing we have is our Norhart Invest platform where we're giving people an opportunity to invest in what we're doing. We keep it very simple. Anyone in the United States can invest, and we're offering a 10% interest rate for investing your money on our platform. So if that sounds interesting, you can also visit our website to see more about that. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Mike. I really, really enjoyed it. And I, yeah, I got so much value. So I appreciate all the wisdom and the advice that you gave today. So thank you again. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.